so we're going to get into our message today, and uh, the title of the message is this, The Truth Will Set You Free. The Truth Will Set You Free. And the title, uh, and the, the big idea of the sermon this morning is when we acknowledge the truth about our rebellion and submit ourselves to the truth, who is Jesus, it is here that we find freedom. So, the truth. We all want it. We all want it actually about other people, don't we? Uh, we, de- we demand to know the truth, the truth about our politicians, uh, the truth about celebrities. I was thinking about celebrities, and when some celebrity uh, advertises their book as a tell-all, nothing will be held back. Oh, we clamor for it. We all want the truth. As you think about our society, trust is at an all-time low. Because so often we have discovered that the truth was not fully shared. We can feel betrayed, and so all we want, really, what we're asking for is the truth. Just tell me the truth. However, there is often a truth that we don't like, and uh, that truth is the truth about ourselves. If someone tries to approach us with this, we'll often lay blame, we will deny, we will redirect But one thing I notice is most of the time, we don't want to hear it. I mean, we can say we do until someone says something. If someone has an addiction, sometimes those who love them will have what's called an intervention, where they will get a lot of people in a room and confront that person with the truth. You have a problem. You need help. And we're here to help you. And we say, well, why do you need a room full of people? Why will not one concerned friend do? Because often people don't want to believe the truth about themselves. And if you tell me it's true, that doesn't mean it's true. But, but in, in, if there's many people that are telling me the same thing, even though it's hard, I might start to believe them. How about you? Do you like to hear the truth about yourself? Have you ever had one of those hard conversations where you had to speak the truth? Hopefully you were able to do it in love. But those are not easy conversations to have. One thing I have realized is that, though, that the more we accept the truth, the more freedom it brings. There are many things that I have had to accept that I am not good at. There are some things I am good at, and many, many, many more I am not. I have discovered that it is only when we accept the truth about ourselves that we can really begin to move forward, even if it hurts a bit at first. But in the end, we realize that there is great freedom in it. This is not only true of our our physical selves, maybe our relational selves, but it's also true of our spiritual self too. Jesus said in John 8, verse 31 and 32, he said, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. When I see and admit that I I am a sinner, that I cannot save myself, it it is only then that I can call out for saving. And it is here that I am free. But it starts with the truth. As we come to the scripture today, Jesus reveals some real truth about our heart. He reveals truth about our, our state and about his offer towards us. And it doesn't happen so much in Jesus' words, because as we'll work through the text today, we see that Jesus doesn't actually speak a lot in this text. But it is revealed in the story that he's telling as it's played out. And so today, we're actually back in the Gospels. We are in Luke chapter 22 verse, and 23. Um, when we were in the Gospels a couple of weeks ago, we left off with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They had had their last supper Uh, That last Passover dinner, they left and they went to the garden and Jesus prayed uh, that the cup of wrath may be taken from him. Remember, Judas came and betrayed him. The uh, The disciples scattered. The temple guards take Jesus away. And this is where we pick up the story today in Luke 22. And Jesus is, is taken from the garden to the home, more, maybe more like a palace of the high priest. And so if you have your Bibles today, you can turn, and we're going to start in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 66. Uh, before we jump into that, though, let's pray. 
So, Father, as we come to you today, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you again, as we do every week. We thank you for the truth of your word. And, Lord, I pray that we would allow your word today to speak its truth into our very hearts. And that, Lord, we would receive your word as truth. And we just acknowledge, God, that that at times is very difficult for us to do. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and to show us, to convict us, to reveal things to us, Lord Jesus. We welcome that. And Lord, I pray that as we welcome your Spirit to come and do its work, I pray, Lord, even as we'll come to the end, Lord, that 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 would bring great joy into our soul. So, Lord, we thank you for all you desire to do this morning. We thank you that you will speak to us because we're opening your word. But we welcome you now to help us to understand and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting in verse 66, it starts like this. It says, when day came. So in order for a hearing to be valid, this is where you remember Jesus has been taken to the, the palace of the high priest. And that was at night, remember that. And so when day came, and in order for a hearing to be valid, it could not happen in the evening. And so while many things happened in the night, questions, beatings, the validity of their accusations that they were bringing before Jesus and calling him to do uh, needed to be done in the day if they were going to be valid. So it says this, so when they came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. They want him to say it in front of them. They, they want an official statement, both for them and for their strategy, to have him killed. As we know, Rome was over Israel at that time. And then one of the things that they could not do was they could not execute people. Only Rome had the authority to do that. And so they needed uh, Jesus to say, that, say this, this so that they could bring him before Pilate. Jesus admitting he is the Christ is both for their sake and for their case before Rome. Why? Because remember the role as they see it. What the Messiah will do, he will free them. In Jesus admitting that he is the Messiah, in their understanding, is the same as saying, I am, I am here to overthrow the Romans. In their asking, they don't want to know if he is the actual Messiah. They want him to say it so that they can have him killed. As the scripture goes on, it says, but he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you will not answer but from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. This is a very loaded response as Jesus uses the title actually from the book of Daniel to say that he is sent from God. I am not the Messiah like you are thinking. I am the guy Daniel prophesied about in Daniel 7. They led him to the council room. This is a pretty big place. The high priest uh, lives in, in this palace and it's, court, it's got courtyards and, and meeting rooms and they take him to the, the council room. And as you read the different accounts in, in maybe in different places in the Gospels, you will see that there are actually two people, both Anna, Annas and Caiaphas. Caiaphas being the official high priest at the moment. Now according to history, what had happened was that in 6 AD, Annas was voted in as a high priest. And a high priest was voted in traditionally uh, for life, maybe kind of like the Pope is, you know. But in 15 AD, some shifty stuff went down, and the Romans removed him as high priest. So you can imagine how that went over, Rome interfering in their faith. Usually Rome stayed out of the religions of their conquered countries, the ones that they had practiced, but here they stepped in. And so the people were, were very loyal to Annas still. And he had a lot of sway over the people. Once they remove Annas as high priest, they set up Annas' son-in-law as high priest. And that was Caiaphas. And so they're at the high priest's home, and Jesus is standing before these two high priests. First, when Anna, uh, first with Annas, and then with Caiaphas. 
these two Levitical high priests from the order of Aaron. But we remember from last week, who is Jesus? We remember from last week that he too is a high priest. Except he's a high priest from a different order, a high priest from a superior order, the order of Melchizedek. And so these three kind of high priests all convene. In verse 70, so they all said, are you the, the son of God then? And, they said to the, and, and he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. There it is, everyone. They've got the scribes there as well. They've got all the council leaders. There it is. You've heard it, right? Everyone has heard it, right? That's all we need. Let's go, let's go take him now before Pilate and let's get this job done. Then the whole company of them arose, beginning in chapter 23, verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. And so they make three accusations against him before Pilate, that he was one that he was telling people not to pay their taxes. And in Galilee, in around 16 AD, there was a big tax revolt that happened uh, that the Romans had to shut down. And so maybe they're trying to point in that direction. Remember what happened last time. This guy is a troublemaker. But we know that that's not the case. We remember quite, quite quickly, remember when Jesus said, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Then they said that he was misleading the people. Now there are leaders and there are leaders. And Jesus, over the course of, this, of his ministry, as we have walked through it, even over the last year, we've been walking through the ministry of Jesus. Over the ministry and course of Jesus' ministry, he has never mis misled anyone. He is always pointing people to the Father. Is that misleading? No. We've all experienced being misled by human leaders. But the one thing I know of Jesus is that he, he never has, nor ever will, mislead. As a matter of fact, he is the only person we can trust to actually lead us to and in truth. And then the third accusation is that he is saying that he is the Christ, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. That he is saying he is sent from God to overthrow the Romans. And these are the charges uh, that are being brought before Pilate. The Jews cannot execute him, so they have to make the charge execution worthy to the Romans. In verse 3, And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Now, Pilate, again, according to historians, will eventually be removed from his role because he was a ruthless, unfair, belligerent leader. He was a tyrant with the Jews. He would indiscriminately kill people all the time. He was ruthless. And his rule, and his rule was actually causing so much trouble in the area that Rome had said to him, you better change or we're going to be removing you. And so because of this, he doesn't really want to kill Jesus for his own career's sake. And so after speaking with Jesus, he says, well, well, this is easy, and he makes a proclamation. I see no guilt in this man. He proclaims Jesus before the people that Jesus is without blemish. He's spotless. There's no guilt here. In Judaism, before a lamb would be sacrificed, it had to be inspected to see if there was any spot or blemish. And as Jesus is inspected, the proclamation is there before all the people. There is no guilt in this man. Uh-oh, they would say. Now what will the leaders do? They respond, I imagine, a little frantic. This isn't going how we had hoped it was going. In verse 5, it says, But they were urgent, saying, uh, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea. He's an agitator, they're saying, against the peace, against Rome. They're, they're just grasping. They, they've got to get this man executed. Teaching throughout all of Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. 
And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. Pilate was said to be the authority over the provinces of Judea and over Samaria. Herod was over the province of Galilee. And so Pilate, he thinks, well, I can send Jesus over there then so I don't have to deal with the blood of an innocent man and risk my career. Verse 8, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. Remember as well, this was the same Herod that had beheaded John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, Remember that John the Baptist had confronted Herod for his sinful lifestyle, but but Herod refused to turn around. Herod refused to, to repent. And as a result, his heart had grown even more spiritually hard. Herod, if you remember, when John the Baptist first spoke of Jesus, was intrigued by Jesus, curious. But by now, Herod had refused God's offer to turn around. And his heart just got harder and harder. Now here we are. And while Herod is curious to see some magic tricks, he's not interested in turning his life around. Verse 9, so he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. As though Jesus was saying, listen, you, you know who I am. My cousin John, he, he told you. The time of those type of miracles that you heard about, that, that's done. It's over. And here's the thing, even even today, every person faced with the reality of Jesus has to choose what to do with him. And while Jesus will come after us for a season, there is a time, I think, when we will refuse him for the last time. And our hearts will move from becoming will move to becoming colder and harder. And I'd ask you this morning, as you're here, has Jesus been coming after you? If he has, what have you done with him? As Jesus stood in the court of Herod, he had to do something with Jesus. As he stands in the court of your life, what will you do with him? My encouragement to you is don't refuse his grace and push him away as Herod had done. Allowing your heart to get harder and harder towards him. Respond, I would say. Jesus knows Herod's heart, and that time for telling who he is 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 past. In verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Every year it was custom as a a way to keep good faith and peace. The Romans would release a a Jewish prisoner. And so they're calling, the, the leaders, the Jewish leaders are calling for them to release Barabbas, a person who actually did threaten Rome, who had been found guilty of murder. Give us Barabbas. In verse 20, Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. And so Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. 
You can imagine the crowd. You can imagine them being so worked up into a frenzy. If Pilate does not give in to their demands, there might be a riot. Or they may go to his superiors and Pilate will pay for not being able to control the Jews. As the crowd continued to, to, to cry and demand in a frantic, frenzied state, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. They had lost it. As the deafening cries of the people rose, Pilate submitted to their will. We will all submit to a will. The question is, whose will? Mine, the world, the devil, God's? Here we see Pilate submitting to their will. As we consider this passage this morning, the Scripture reveals, I think, many things to us. It does not only tell us the events of the trial and the sort of mischarges that were actually there, but when you look a little closer, you see that it also reveals our own hearts. We read the Scripture, but often the Scripture also reads us. So what does this passage beyond the events of the trial reveal to us? The first thing I thought that it revealed, I mean, many things are there, and maybe you have yours as we've gone through it. There are three things that I picked out this morning, and the first was that Jesus, the, the story of this trial, Jesus' story reveals our heart. In the story In the events of this trial, our heart is revealed. I think it's found in the rebellion of the Jewish leaders. No greater picture, I think, of the state of the human heart is shown than this picture here. It is is as though Jesus says to us here, let me prove my point. Let me show you why I'm going to the cross. Look, look at these Jewish leaders. I show up on the scene. I love them, call them, tell them why I am here. God sends me for them. I show show them who I am. I show them what I have come to do. It's not to hurt them, but to redeem them, to set them free because they are unable to do it themselves. What an offer that God is providing for these people. And what is their response? We need to kill them. We need to get rid of them. Unless we think that, that, that this is just these Jewish leaders, it's not. It's us too. I mean, think about it. Who wants to be God of their own life? Everyone does. We want what we want. And when Jesus shows up and asks for that position in our lives as well, if we're honest, we don't always want to give it to Him. We might want Him to come in and fix all of our mistakes, Take us to heaven, but to take over as Lord? Hmm. Well, at least not maybe until we've made a complete mess of things and there seems to be no other option. We finally give up. But even then, we let them in maybe sometimes to certain parts of our life, but not others. We, we, we close sides off to him. Like maybe we receive Jesus, say, <laughs> Lord Jesus, Look, you're offering me heaven. Yeah, come on into my life. That's great. And he comes in. He says, hey, Marcel, this is great. He says, okay, first order of business is forgiveness. It's been ruining your life. You need to, word, to, to move towards forgiving that person. Ah, nice try, Jesus. That's a good one. I don't think so. That's a no-go zone, Jesus. You don't know what happened. You don't know the issues. Now, you, you can come in and fix my problems, but, you know, being king, taking over, yeah, I don't know. Okay, he says, let's talk about your money. <laughs> yeah, another good one. Don't touch that. Okay, how about your dating life? I don't have a dating life, but let's, you know, if I did, <laughs> what about your dating life? Yeah, don't think so. If I'm honest with you, this is true of my life. I want what I want. And when I want something, I don't want someone to tell me something different. I I remember, and I've told you this before, that uh, this was a long time ago, so if you're new, you wouldn't have heard this, but when I was first, when Christine and I were first engaged, and we did some pre-marriage counseling, and I didn't, and so we sat in with the pastor, and we were going to have this test, and we were all supposed to do the test. 
And, uh, and then what we were going to do is we were going to see where we might have I areas of issues, right, on the graph. They would graph our responses and say, oh, well, you got some problems here and problems there. And I didn't want anybody, especially this pastor, you know, telling me, hey, you know, I don't think Christine's right for you. No, I didn't want that at all. So I lied on the whole test, right? <laughs> I want anybody to tell me nothing. And the guy, the pastor pulls out the chart and he's like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. It's like, perfect, you guys are going to have no problems at all. Why? Because I want what I want. I remember one time Christina asking me to do this. This has become a little bit of a joke, but I remember Christina asking me to do something, and I said no. And I said because I, and it was because I was comfortable on the couch. And then in a joking way, I said, listen, I do what I want when I want. To which she responded by saying, that's great. Now take out the garbage. Um, but then I said, in another joking way, I said, you know what? I think that's going to be my motto for my life. I do what I want, when I want. And so I figured it out in Latin because everything sounds so much better in Latin as a motto, right? So, quad ego volo si volo. So that's what it is in Latin. And, and it, it became kind of a joke between us. The kids picked up on it. It's not a good thing at all. But anyway, it's, it's meant jokingly. But you know what? It's also true. It's also true. We want what we want. And if Jesus shows up and threatens that, well, we might find ourselves more like Jewish leaders than we care to admit. But until I come face to face with the truth about who I am, I will never be able to move forward. And I will never really be free. I want what I want. My flesh wants to be God. We see that right from the garden. And I almost didn't tell you that. I was right, as I was writing this, I was like, should I really tell them? <laughs> it sounds like I'm such a horrible guy. I didn't want you to think about me that way. But again, that's my flesh. I don't want you to think this way about me. I want you to think of me as greater than I really am. My flesh is the exact same as those Jewish leaders. My flesh wants to rule. And it doesn't take kindly to competition. When we accept that and acknowledge that, it's kind of painful at first. But it's now when we accept that and see the reality, when I see the reality of who I really am, it's now that I can begin to move towards freedom in all of its ugliness. Because I think it's when we come face to face with this truth, it is then our eyes are opened and we see the truth of our, of our heart and then we begin to see the truth of our state with us as God in our life. The second thing that he reveals to us is the truth of our state. Jesus reveals our state. We, we get a great picture of our actual state when we look at Jesus' trial. Because we want to be God's we want to rule. We are in charge. But the story also shows us another person. And that person is Barabbas. One who is in chains. One who is not free at all. One who is waiting for his execution. His death. He was a rebel. He had sought to get freedom from the Romans by his own way. He had been charged and found guilty of insurrection and murder. And I think what we don't see often is that this is the destination of us as our own gods. That the truth is that, that being our own gods, while we might think is great in the moment, it only leads to bondage and death. I wonder if as Barabbas sat in that dark, damp prison, did he wish that he had done things different? I don't know. I wonder what went through his mind as he sat in that dark cell waiting for his death. Was he fearful of the pain? Was he fearful that this was it? Did he leave behind a wife and kids? I wonder when he heard his name called what was going through his mind as the guard says, get up Barabbas, it's time to go. I wonder what he expected as he left his cell. I imagine him being in chains, dirty, hungry, exhausted, being pushed along a dark, musty corridor. Maybe the guards using spears to make him move a little faster. I'm pretty certain that whatever he was thinking, he was not expecting what he got. 
He had done things his way, which landed him there in prison. But then as he comes out before Pilate and a frenzied crowd shouting, Give us Barabbas! He was given his freedom. You see, being our own God only leads us to a prison. And eventually death. Even if we can't see it at the beginning. Because we have no authority to save. And even if the devil lies to us, telling us that we do, oh, you don't need God. Because you can be God. The problem is that that's a lie. And it only ends in the same place as Barabbas. In prison, waiting for death. Well, we think we're in charge like the Jewish leaders thought they were in charge. The truth is we're Barabbas with a heart that wants what it wants. Finally, today, Jesus, however, does not only reveal our heart and reveal our state, he also reveals his offer. Jesus willingly takes Barabbas' place. Jesus, who is innocent. Jesus, who only seeks to glorify the Father. Jesus, who came to rescue us, does just that on the cross. Rescues us from the prison of, and death sentence that await, just like Barabbas. And listen, we know this, but Jesus does not find himself before Pilate. He does not find himself before Herod or before the Jewish leaders because he was betrayed. Or because people have it in for him. That's not why he is there. He is there because that is why he came. Even if you can't see it, Jesus can see it. He can see your prison. He can see your death sentence. He can see our, our rebellious heart that wants what it wants and it wants us to be God. And so he came. And he takes our place. As Romans chapter 5 says that, that while we were his enemies, that while we were chanting, crucify him, crucify him, he died for us. That we were guilty of our, for our crimes as Barabbas was. But he offers to take our place. And instead of us dying on the cross for our sin, our rebellion, he says, if you let me die, you can go free. This is his offer. It's an amazing offer. Jesus is the truth. And the truth will set you free. I'm going to invite the worship team to come as we close this morning. But yesterday as we gathered in our small group to pray, we were reminded that we are Barabbas. And it shaped our prayers. How does one pray who has just been freed from a death sentence? How does one live? I understand that, well, at the beginning for Barabbas, when he got home, he was probably pretty happy. You'll never believe what happened to me. I kind of imagine him just running home. Yeah. You know, like Scrooge at the end of the thing, you know, and he's so happy about Christmas. He's running around. I've been free. I wonder how that moment changed him and shaped him. Maybe he went back to his old tricks. We do not know. But I hope that this freedom that you have received shapes you. That you, who were once held captive on charges that you were guilty of, but Jesus willingly took your place. That we allow that truth to shape us that we have been freed, but different than Barabbas, we have not just been freed to live out the rest of our lives. We have been freed to inherit eternal life. And when we really see this for what it is, when we really see our heart, when we really see we're the ones chanting crucify, and when we really see the fact that we're the ones in prison for our own guilty actions, it's really, really hard to hold on to offense. It's hard to not just be really, really grateful. 
that you've been given a second chance and that instead of death, you have life. And I hope that today, that the joy, the joy of what you have been given floods your soul. To the degree to which we see our own heart and the depravity of it will be the degree to which we experience joy. And I hope that you will experience great amounts of joy. You have been set free. You have been given another chance. Someone has taken, Jesus has taken your punishment on himself. If you're here today and you have never responded to the offer of Jesus, he makes, he, he makes it to you. He says, listen, I, I will take your place on the cross that your sin might be paid for, that you might be free, that you might have eternal life. And today you can even receive that for yourself. And I would say, however, if you are sensing his call, do not dismiss that. If you're saying, I, I, I'm feeling like Jesus is, is speaking to me today to respond, do not dismiss. Because like Herod, you know, we, we never know when that last time is. That last time when he will come around to yourself and knock on the door and say, if you want, I'll take your place. If you're sensing God call you, don't wait, just respond to him. I'm going to be at the front today, just over here. And if you're here and you need prayer for something, I'd love to pray with you. If you want to respond to Jesus and his call towards you, i love to pray with you for that as well. If you came with a friend, let them pray with you or both come pray together. We also run a thing called the Why Jesus Course. We talk about it every week, but we run it. It's uh, three weeks, it, just one hour, three sessions, and we run it on Sunday morning. You can sign up for that in your bulletin. And uh, it's a three-week course that will help you understand what it means to respond to the offer of Jesus. All three are good responses. I would just say, make sure you respond. Let's pray and then we'll sing. Father, as we come to you today, Lord, I thank you for the truth that you revealed to us. I so see myself as one of those Jewish leaders crying out to get rid of you. But I thank you that as you revealed that to me, I see that for what it is, I can respond to you. I can allow you to come in and to set me free from my own prison and guilt and shame. Lord, help us to see on a deeper level what you have done for us. And I pray that as we do that, that, Lord, we would just experience the joy, the gratefulness, the sheer amazement and wonder of a God who would love us so much that even while we were enemies, you came and you died for us. In Jesus' name.